Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful day. My name is Joe Barton. I'm one of the trustees for the Moya Library and Ross Historical Society. Uh, we put on these uh, first Friday forenoon presentations uh, once a month during, uh, during the spring and summer and fall. Uh, we really appreciate your support. We're an all-volunteer organization, and, uh, and we, uh, we certainly love having you here and, and having these programs. Today, you're joining us for the Crookedest Railroad Locomotive Number 9. We have Fred Runner with us today. He's going to take us through some exciting uh, pictures and discussions about this historic uh, train. And um, let me just say that this is, uh, this is a webinar. Many of you, mm -hmm. I can see, have joined us before. But just to remind you and those who maybe haven't joined us for a webinar, that you're welcome to ask questions. There's a Q&A button or a uh, chat button at the bottom of your screen, and you're welcome to type in a question. We'll save all the questions for, uh, for the end of the program. We've allocated some time for that. And, uh, and you can also raise your hand if, if you wanna actually talk, uh, verbalize your question uh, and have a discussion with Fred, we can, we can bring you in for that too, if, if you're so inclined. So, um, so again, thank you for joining us today. And let me uh, hand it over to Richard Torney to introduce our guest. All right, thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'm always looking forward to hearing uh, Fred Runner's uh, programs. So our guest speaker today, Fred Runner, uh, by profession is a sound technician in the film and television industry, has worked on a lot of um, of pro uh, movies like The Right Stuff and Mrs. Doubtfire, TV series and commercials. But he's got a hobby and that's the hobby is what's gonna be the focus of the program today. So uh, his hobby is the Mount Tamalpais and Muirwood Scenic Railway. And he's been interested in that for many, many years. In 1996, when the centennial of the opening of the railroad was celebrated, uh, Fred was a big part of organizing that and participating in it. Uh, he's also written a book about the Ma Mount Tamalpais Railroad and uh, for a number of years served on the board of directors of <clears throat> West Point Inn, which is the only remaining structure that was part of the railroad operations. Um, <clears throat> he was very involved with the uh, creation and construction of the gravity car barn on East Peak and was uh, and did most of the work on creating the display that's seen in the barn. So his latest project having to do with this railroad is locomotive number nine, which is the only surviving piece of equipment that actually worked on the railroad on Mount Tamalpais. Um, uh, in a nutshell, it was on display in Northern California for many years and was recently purchased at auction by a group that is called the Friends of Number Nine, which is a nonprofit, and uh, would hope you'd be interested in learning about more about that organization, the Friends of Number Nine. So anyway, uh, let's turn it over to Fred Runner. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Pardon me. Good morning, and thank you, Joe, also for uh, welcoming us all here today. Um, I'm. The president of the Friends of Number Nine. Um, thrilled to say, I wanted to just sort of throw in a, a quick personal story at the beginning of this to explain, on some level, why I, I ever became interested in Mount Tamil Pius and the railroad there. When I was a kid, um, my grandparents had a, a place out on Tamales Bay in Inverness, and uh, that was a great place to go as a kid and and also growing up. Um, when I at that at that age, um, a friend of the family gave us a book. Um, on the narrow gauge railroad that used to run up Tamales Bay. And as a little boy, uh, the thought of steam trains running along the other side of the bay, um, up through Marshall and um, on up to the Russian River and all that just sounded like a really fun thing. And I remember that one of the author's names on the cover of the book was a guy named Ted Worm. And of course, as a little kid, I thought the name Worm was kind of funny. And then later on, I grew up and found out that there was a railroad on Mount Tam, and that seemed interesting too. So uh, when I found out that the book had been written by Ted Worm, the same guy, I thought that was pretty amazing. And, uh, and then as things went, um, I became his friend and uh, <clears throat> learned about 
the railroad straight from Ted. And uh, before he passed away, he gave me his files on Mount Tam, said, I'm passing the torch to you. Um, and that was um, a, an amazing thrill from, you know, being a child who read a book by Ted Worm to growing up to be his friend and then being given his files on Mount Tam. Um, so that's where my interest in all this began. Anyway, um, so like, as I mentioned, I'm a Fred Runner and I'm the president of the Friends of Number Nine. We are a all volunteer nonprofit organization uh, that has the only surviving piece of the once famous Mount Tamil Pius and Muir Woods Railway, engine number nine. Last month, engine number nine turned 100 and we wanted to celebrate because of course, centennials only come once in a lifetime. So, as you know, um, a century ago, Mill Valley had an internationally famous tourist attraction that was the grandest mountain railway ride in the world. Um, it was the Mount Tamil Pius and Muir Woods Railway, a scenic railway that showed natural wonders, um, spectacular views, and offered hospitality on both a mountaintop and in a primeval forest known as Muir Woods. <clears throat> on a local level, most of the employees lived in Mill Valley. Imagine that, an internationally famous industry and everyone walked to work. And they all said, every one of them, that it was the best job they ever had. That's what they always said. A hundred years ago in April, a new, the last new locomotive arrived, engine number nine. Number nine was the first new engine in 12 years. That was a big deal. A custom built steam engine. Oops, I got ahead of myself here. That's the one we want to look at. Um, number nine was a big deal. It was a custom built steam engine built especially for work on Mount Tamil Pius. It cost $16,000, which is about a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. Engine number nine was 34 feet long and still is, <laughs> um, weighed 36 tons. The railroad carried an average of 35,000 people every year, over 1 million passengers in its lifetime. And because of efficient railroad connections at Mill Valley, the town hardly ever noticed. Joe Marshall, the man on the left, uh, was the railroad's master mechanic in 1921. He is likely the one who ordered num engine number nine. Number nine made the front page of the Mill Valley record. Engine number nine arrived on April 18th, 1921. Um, on April 18th, 2021, 100 years later, the friends of number nine celebrated the engine centennial with a loud blast from the past. More on that later. But first, let me give some background on the scenic railway. <clears throat> in 1896, a small group of Marin businessmen did a bold thing in a small town. They built a scenic railway up Mount Tamil Pius, eight winding miles from the dirt streets of Mill Valley to the rocky summit of Mount Tamil Pius. In 1896, San Francisco was the biggest city west of St. Louis. What we think of as the West was everything from the Mississippi River to the Golden Gate. San Francisco was the jewel of, of the West, of course, but in between San Francisco and St. Louis was really nothing. Uh, where would their customers come from? As a business venture, this was awfully bold. In 1896, the Mill Valley Mount Tamil Pius Scenic Railway created an engineering marvel that was widely praised. It took six months for workmen to build the railroad grade using picks and shovels, wheelbarrows and blasting powder. An average of 200 laborers gouged, chipped, and blasted an eight and a quarter mile grade by hand from the solid rock of Mount Tamil Pius. 21 wooden trestles spanned creeks and canyons along the way. The first engine, engine number 498, moved supplies from Mill Valley uh, up the new rails to the workers at the, at the railhead. By the way, this photo is uh, kind of a fun photo. If you look um, in the upper left corner right in here, you can actually see a train climbing the mountain. When they got to the summit, they built the Tavern of Tamil Pius. And when they were done in 1896, they lit a bonfire to proclaim that they were open. And San Francisco saw the bonfire blazing in the night sky. The, Tamil Pius, the Tavern of Tamil Pius had a lobby and a small restaurant and served local meat and produce. Beer and wine were both local and international. Wines came from both France, the Napa Valley, and uh, even Livermore. They had a variety of beers that were offered, ranging from Paps Blue Ribbon to Guinness Stout imported from Ireland. Upstairs, there were eight guest bedrooms. 
the railroad quickly became uh, more popular than they imagined. In 1897, a year after opening, tourists could overwhelm the tavern and its restaurant when train loads of over 200 passengers show up. So uh, they built the dance pavilion. It's the building on the left that you see in the upper left corner. Um, it could also double as a dining room. An archway spanned the tracks. Guests could stand in the archway ab above the track and watch the steam trains arrive or depart. Paths were quickly built um, up to and around the summit for sightseeing. Also in 1897, the telephone line was run from Mill Valley up to the summit. It was technology at the summit and, a US, the, other, uh, and the US Weather Service uh, began collecting data to help forecast the weather. The next year, in March of 1898, Thomas Edison's film crew shot movies of the railroad, likely the first movies shot in Marin. The small railroad threw all its resources into the effort. It was a brilliant move that would show people on the East Coast moving pictures of a new scenic railway in far off California. <clears throat> a few months later, in July of 1898, the scenic railroad was a cover story of Scientific American. The magazine praised the railroad as an engineering marvel and gave examples. For most people, the trip from Mount Tamalpais started at the ferry building, right over here. Um, a white steam-powered steam ferry boat carried passengers across the bay to Sausalito. Uh, then a narrow gauge train carried them from Mill Valley or from Sausalito into Mill Valley. Um, and then uh, finally, on, you'd change trains in Mill Valley and you were on your way up the mountain through the double bow knot past West Point, um, and finally arriving at the tavern of Tamil Pius. The whole trip took just under two hours. In 1896, Marin County looked like this. Pastoral uh, vistas were everywhere. This is Southern Marin County, the view from Sausalito, the Sausalito Hills to Mount Tamil Pius. Railroad tracks uh, to Mill Valley ran along the Bay Shore along the right side of the frame right here. And Richard would be able to tell you better than I about how the original rail line actually arced around the Bay Shore here and then headed across the, uh, the bay on a, on a trestle across to Strawberry Point. Um, also in this, in this image is, was common in those days, they took these wonderful photos on very large negatives with lots of detail. And if you blew this up, you'd see a little steam train running along the, the marshlands here in Mill, heading for Mill Valley. Tracks to Mill Valley ran across west, the wetlands, the area that I was just pointing to in the previous shot. Of course, today, this is Miller Avenue, somewhere near Tam High. The Scenic Railway's first depot was on the dirt streets of downtown Mill Valley. This building is still there on Throckmorton Avenue. Today, it's called the store. This is where you'd climb aboard the mountain train. Two toots of the whistle and the adventure began. The journey climbed eight miles of twisting track up a steep mountainside. The view kept changing as, as passengers would stand as the city of San Francisco first came into view. There were 281 curves between Mill Valley and the summit, enough curves to equal 42 complete circles, an average of five per mile. The railroad began calling itself the crookedest railroad in the world. At the summit, the Tavern in Tamil Pius was a popular destination that expanded quickly. Business was so good that in 1900, the tavern expanded again, adding 30 rooms, substantially enlarging the second floor and the dining room, which was down at the far end on the right. Behind the archway was the railway yard. So this is the other side of the archway. Um, where trains parked and then waited for the next trip down the mountain. Uh, the tavern is on the left, here. Um, the dance pavilion is in the middle, right here. This is the U.S. weather station over on the right. You can see some guys working on painting the, the building. Um, here's the yard that changed configuration a few times over the life of the railroad. These are some early buildings that uh, disappear over the lifetime of the railroad, and it's hard to say what's going on here. It sort of looks like a tennis court, but the level place is actually too small for that. So not sure what that was. The West Point Inn, um, built in 1904, was a place where steam trains met a horse-drawn stagecoach for the beach. The inn is a vestige of the Wild West, honest. It has a history of an attempted stagecoach holed up by a masked gunman. 
West Point Inn still stands today and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In non-COVID times, you can spend the night here. There was also the Muir Woods Inn, a rustic inn that welcomed uh, the first tourists to Muir Woods. This is the main building with a lobby, a bar, and a restaurant inside. John Muir himself dined here. Guests spent the night in nearby cabins. Sadly, this wonderful rustic building didn't last five years before it burned down. A variety of rustic cabins where guests could spend the night were nearby. Some had canvas roofs for all the fresh air you could want. Others were entirely made of wood and built a little closer to the Muir Woods Inn. Railway employees were the first guides at Muir Woods. Fred Whitmore, seen here on the right, this gentleman here, um, was, uh, was a guide for uh, tourists and celebrities. In June of 1923, when engine number nine was on the mountain, Whitmore was the guide for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the man smart enough and clever enough to invent Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle came with his family and then later wrote a short memoir of their trip. In it, he said, in all our wanderings, we've never had a more glorious experience. He praised the railroad as a good and reverent steward of its lands. He said that it has been made accessible and yet tenderly guarded from all vulgarity. One is not allowed to pick so much as a flower in the Redwood Grove, and one feels that all of this should be national park land. Yep, that's one too far. Mount Tamalpais was also famous for its gravity cars, four-wheel coasters with a brakeman that coasted down the mountain at 12 miles an hour, which is roughly as fast as most mountain bikers go today. Gravity cars were invented in 1902. They were a fun and money-saving way for the railroad to bring overnight guests at the tavern down the mountain. Initially, they departed the tavern at sunrise, heading down to Mill Valley to meet a morning commute train. The company liked the joke that the cars were powered by gravity. The, um, the fun thing about, about the 1902 invention of them was that it was, uh, the schedule was coordinated not just to bring them down to Mill Valley, but it was designed so that business people could actually come over, bring clients the night before, um, wine and dine them, close a business deal, spend the night, give their client a, an extraordinary experience, and then in the morning depart the, the tavern at 7.20, head down the mountain, catch the Mill Valley commute trains that left frequently in the morning, um, head to Sausalito, get the ferry boat to San Francisco, You'd arrive at the ferry building at 9.05 a.m., walk through the ferry building, and on the other side was streetcar service to pretty much everywhere in downtown um, San Francisco. You'd probably be at work by 9.15 or 9.20 at the outside, so why wouldn't you want to bring your clients to up Mount Tamalpais? Gravity cars were towed back to the summit for the next scheduled run. You can see two gravity cars on the right here in the foreground. By the way, this is how trains ran up Mount Tamalpais. The locomotive backed its way up the mountain, pushing passenger cars on the mountain. It was primarily a safety feature that, um, that that way no one ever had to worry about the couplings breaking and a car careening down the mountain. But it also kept the smoke out of their faces. The engines led the way back down the mountain. They never turned around. This photograph was actually taken by Bill Provines, uh, the last living crewman who worked on the railroad and a longtime resident of Mill Valley. Bill's photograph on his day off, um, standing in one of the gravity cars, they always put employees in there um, so that if the gravity cars should by chance break loose, there would be somebody there to stop them. Um, Bill enjoyed working on the mountain railroad so that even on his day off, he decided to ride in the gravity cars going back up. Got a free ride and, and uh, didn't have to worry about uh, monitoring the controls on the steam engines um, on, a, on the day off. Sometimes gravity cars were uh, carried passengers, um, but that was against the rules, of course, unless the boss said it was okay. The small railroad was smart about promotion also. They hired the best photographers of the day to, to take beautiful, inspiring shots of the, mountains, the mountain railroad's features. Famed frontier photographer, William Henry Jackson was one of them. Jackson was a kind of Ansel Adams of the frontier. This is one of his shots. He and his crew hauled around a huge camera that shot spectacular photos on two, two foot by two foot glass negatives. Another photographer was E.A. Cohen. Uh, these photos appeared in brochures and also on postcards, like this one. Photos like this were available as souvenirs in the lobby of, 
uh, in the lobby of the railroad's inns, looking down, looking down from the summit in a time when the vegetation was far lighter than it is today at the double bow knot, um, a long exposure clearly showing the blurred fog rolling over the, the uh, hills of Trockmorton Ridge. Another great thing was the mountain play. In the teens and, 19, and early 20s, or throughout the 20s, uh, the theater was a hillside meadow, not terraced with stone seats the way they are today. Many hiked to the mountain theater from various parts of Marin. Lots of people uh, from the city came by train. Long before yellow school buses, this was a big deal for the railroad. It was also the single busiest day of the year for West Point Inn. Extra staff had to be hired. The trains dropped people at the inn. The innkeepers took orders for fresh chicken dinners. This shot is from around 1920 when the railroad laid a, uh, tracks down the stage road, a siding to park trains and passenger coaches on. The productions like like Robin Hood in 1918 used the natural landscape of the theater as a set. Mount Tamalpais became Sherwood Forest. Here are two of Robin Hood's characters, made merry and standing, and then uh, the character of Shadow of a Leaf. The costumes had wonderful detail. As you can see, there was a lot going on. The railway offered food and drink and hospitality with city style against a rustic backdrop. As most everyone knows, its primary business was tourism, showing people a breathtaking view of, from a mountaintop or a chance to stroll around a primeval canyon called Muir Woods. But there was also an interesting subtext of environmentalism. They promoted wilderness preservation in the early days of doing such things. And they made wil the Marin wilderness an easy and accessible thing to appreciate and rejuvenating in, uh, when compared to the noisy and frequently smelly cities of that era. Automobiles became, as automobiles became more popular, ridership dwindled. And in 1929, the last year of the Crookedest Railroad, um, automobiles were, were gaining ground. In 1930, the railroad was brutally scrapped. The rails were ripped from the ground, passenger cars were burned in a Mill Valley Creek, and presumably the gravity cars too. The remaining metal was, was then scooped out as scrap, the locomotives were also sold or scrapped. The railroad was swept away and then thrown on a trash heap called Progress. All the locomotives, except for one. Engine number nine was the one that got away. This is engine number nine in 1921 at the factory just before being shipped to Mill Valley, California. Today, this is a unique insight into the once famous and popular railroad. It's an incomparable relic. It had real gold leaf lettering on the tender, five inch tall letters on, um, uh, with a red drop shadow. It's a, here's a, we're gonna give a brief photographic tour of number nine's life. This is what number nine looked like in 1921. You can see it still had the original lettering on the side of the tender in the back. Um, this is number nine in 1922, and then the original lettering is now gone. Um, so we believe that there was a, that it had a, a brand new coat of paint and been re-lettered when that happened. This is again, July of 1922. Here's number nine again at East Peak. This is in 1923, shortly after the Grand Tavern of Tamil Pius burned down. That's the rubble of the tavern on the right there. Uh, this photo was taken as part of a Chevy PR stunt. Chevrolet was trying to show its trucks were as tough as steam engines. Some things never change. In 1924, number nine was sold. It had been a very bad year financially for the railroad. The Grand Tavern of Tamil Pius at East Peak had burned to the ground and was underinsured. The new tavern needed to be rebuilt as a destination for guests. A hoof and mouth disease epidemic also canceled the mountain play. So selling number nine, the newest engine on the line was the easiest way to put the railroad back in the black. Number nine then began a 30 year career in forest logging. By 1953, the logging career was over. The engine was sitting on a siding waiting to be scrapped. On an uh, interesting you know, bit of minutia here, um, this uh, air pressure tank here has the date written on the side of when it was last used, July 24, 1953. At a time when steam engines were being replaced by diesel trucks, the Pacific Lumber Company bought number nine, probably for its scrap metal value. 
They spent three years restoring it. And in 1956, they put the engine on display near a brand, brand new museum they had just opened up. The museum could now use number nine to tell a rich story of local steam powered forest logging and also its story as the last engine of Mount Tamalpais. Pacific Lumber took good care of number nine, <clears throat> preparing it for decades, standing outside in the damp humble weather every few years, adding a new coat of paint. But by 2018, 62 years after 62 years on display, the town no longer wanted the locomotive and number nine was put up for auction. Out of six bidders, the friends of number nine bid the highest, but just barely. We bid $56,240, just 6% more than the runner up. Winning involved removing all the equipment from this park, a process that involved cranes and trucks and money. On November 27, 2018, almost 28 years after the order for number nine first landed on a desk in Erie, Pennsylvania, number nine left Scotia and began a 200 mile trip home. The next morning, we unloaded number nine, lifting the 36 ton locomotive from a trailer and placing it on two rails in Sonoma County. We've been very lucky. Our landlord has allowed us to park number nine in Sonoma for, for free. The deal is though, that we have to keep the location secret. As long as people don't come snooping, we can have free rent. So we like that bargain. Anyway, that's when our rest restoration work began. That's a process of full of detail. Uh, the friends of number nine have come a long way in creating a list of everything on the locomotive. What's there, what's missing, what needs to be restored. Our goal is to restore number nine to how it looked in 1921 when it first came to Mount Tamalpais. A surprising amount of the engine is intact. Pacific Lumber did a wonderful, wonderfully thoughtful job of preparing number nine for display outside in the damp weather. Things like uh, putting a steel lid on top of the smokestack to keep everything dry inside. If rainwater mixes with the old ash, it becomes sulfuric acid and then of course eats the metal up. Brass bells were also very popular with souvenir hunters. Fortunately, Pacific Lumber put a pin in the top nut to make it almost impossible to remove. So we still have the original bell. Our list also includes the gauges that we need to find and rusted metal that needs to be cut out and replaced. And when we do that, we hope to, we plan to leave as much original metal as possible, um, carving out only the places that are seriously corroded, but leaving all the original rivets in, in place so that when we get done, the locomotive will look the way it did in 1921. We had to map out the things we needed to fix or replace, combing through the original 1920 order and the historic photos that we have. This illustration drawn by Joe Breeze, um, he spent hundreds of hours measuring and then drawing a computer blueprint, if you will, of number nine that has been tremendously helpful to us. Joe Breeze's research and drawings are helping us to see what number nine will look like when we restore when we restore it. One of our first issues, of course, was asbestos, a common thing on steam engines back in those days, but today a tremendous liability. Last summer, we hired Central Valley Environmental, a professional hazmat contractor, to safely contain and then remove the asbestos. They built an airtight containment structure around number nine, complete with zippers. In fact, they were even patriotic zippers with red, white, and blue. Then we uh, removed the asbestos, asbestos and took it to a hazmat landfill. We got a price break. It only cost $12,000. As we were getting ready to remove the asbestos, we also had to do some work in the fire pan under the engine, the area where a huge fire burned beneath the boiler. I'm told the, when the engine worked, an 1800 degree fire raged there, furiously burning, trying to turn cold water into steam. The fire pan where the fire burned um, also had some asbestos. We discovered that um, besides asbestos, it also had a, was a time capsule. We found a collection of old Shasta soda cans Interestingly, no beer cans were there, but we also found some charred wood. Our steam expert, David Waterman, recognized this as a piece of a window frame. We took the parts up to number nine's cab. These parts fit in only one window of the cab. 
Here's a photo of the same window in 1961, roughly the, the, the last time things were thrown into the fire pan. It's damaged here. The left side is missing. We think someone wanted to see a fire down in the firebox. So they took pieces of, of the wooden window, lit them, and then tossed them in uh, to see a flickering fire in the fire pan. Most of the pieces never burned completely, luckily. Beneath the charred black paint, we found the red paint of the Mount Tamalpais Railway. This is the only known sample of the original paint. And it matches a, a very nicely with a painting that uh, was created by historians Harlan Heine and Roy Graves, who worked on uh, the engines, Roy Graves worked on the engines of Mount Tam back in 1907. He was uh, the first fireman, he was a fireman on the first train into Muir Woods, a train load full of school kids coming to see what Virgin Redwoods were all about. As you know, Mount Tamalpais, uh, the Mount Tamalpais and Muir Woods Railway was in fact the first way for tourists to get to and appreciate Muir Woods. Long before cars were a problem there, the railway brought thousands. Something else that, uh, that's happening is that we're hearing from descendants of Tamalpais Railway employees. This is Russ and John Davis, two brothers who through Ancestry.com learned that they were descendants of the first engineer on Mount Tam, a man named Ernest Thomas. Thomas was not only the first engineer on Mount Tam, but he was also the master mechanic. Sadly, Thomas was killed in the first railroad accident on Mount Tam in 1900. Luckily, um, uh, in 34 years, there were only two accidents. John Davis wanted to contribute to the restoration of uh, number nine and will contribute to restoring the engine's cab details, the missing levers, the gauges, and the hardware of number nine. That's uh, Ernest Thomas in the cab of engine number two, also a Heisler engine that was on, worked on in the early time on, on, on Tamil Pius. On April 18th, number nine was 100 years old, only a few weeks ago. We uh, felt it was really important to celebrate the very last piece of the scenic railway on earth. One of the things we needed to restore was a steam whistle. What better way to celebrate a 100th birthday than to blow a steam whistle? Whistles are an important tool on a locomotive. They're its voice signaling to the crew on board or nearby. Two toots means the brakes are off. Three toots means we're backing up. They're also important for signaling the public at, at railroad crossings. We commissioned the recreation of number nine's 1921 steam whistle. We were lucky enough to find Chris Rizzoli, a man with 46 years experience building steam whistles. Here's Chris and his dad in their machine shop. Today, Chris makes and repairs steam whistles for railroads all over the country. Uh, his new, uh, this new whistle is the fourth whistle for engine number nine. The original whistle that was on engine number nine in 1921 right here, um, seemed to never made it to Mill Valley. The only photo that we have um, shows the, the photo, the, show, the only photo we have of the engine at the factory shows the original whistle on number nine before it was shipped. And as mentioned, it never got to Mill Valley. Um, when number nine arrived, the railroad needed a, qu a whistle quickly. Number nine would make its first trip up the mountain in a, a week after the engine arrived. Here's the whistle that the railroad built. It's a homemade whistle built from parts around the workshop using boiler tubes um, and such. It's called a Casey Jones whistle. It's different from most others. It has four tubes or four voices. Most whistles have one, three, or five voices. This one has four. Here's the whistle that was on number nine when we bought it. Um, it's the, the third whistle that the engine had had. Chris took the old whistle apart. He found damaged parts that would be dangerous if we used them. So he rebuilt the guts of the whistle from solid brass. The old uh, cast iron piece is on the right with its damaged threads. On the right is a new piece that he machined for us out of solid brass. Uh, then it was time to create the pipes. We gave Chris our best 1921 photo of the whistle. He drew a grid over it and used that to approximate the size of the tubes. He made adjustable tubes so that we could tune them for the best possible harmony and uh, then took it to his brother's shop up in the Sierras 
uh, a place where he could make a lot of noise and not bother the neighbors. And then he began tuning the whistle. When he was done, he measured the adjustable tubes um, to a thousandth of an inch and then welded fixed and welded new fixed length tubes. Easy for me to say, right? Uh, the finished product was flashier and probably sounds much better than the original. This is how we celebrated number nine's uh, 100th birthday, blowing this whistle in a live virtual event um, streamed online, viewable on Friends of Number Nine's website. Here's a little piece of our uh, of our uh, video, and I'm going to um, need to bail out of the slideshow for a minute so I can show you the, visit, the, the video. So we'll do that and select this and go back to screen sharing. And then go to this. <clears throat> and here we go with a piece of our uh, of our live event. Steam whistles are one of the most endangered sounds on the American landscape. They don't sound anything like the modern horn on a, on a train. They're usually more musical. They are in a minor key, and they make a sound that has inspired songwriters and musicians for over 100 years. Songs like Peter, Paul, and Mary's 500 Miles and Frank Sinatra's Blues in the Night. Paul Simon wrote a song entitled, Everybody Loves the Sound of a Train in a Distance. So do we. A steam whistle is also an essential tool on a locomotive. It speaks to the crew, both on board and nearby. Two toots means the brakes are off. Three toots means we're backing up. You get the idea. A steam whistle can also celebrate, um, they can also celebrate a, a centennial, loudly and proudly. To celebrate the arrival of number nine in Mill Valley, David Waterman, a locomotive engineer and steam railroading expert, and a board member of Friends of Number Nine will blow our recreated 1921 steam whistle. It's the very first, it's the very first time this whistle's been heard in public. Let's bring 1921 back to life. Thanks very much for joining us on this very special day for engine number nine of the Mount Tamil Pius and Muir Woods Railway. As you can see, our restoration work is just beginning. We've removed hundreds of pounds of asbestos, recreated a steam whistle from 100 years ago. We can always use your help. We'd like to invite you to become a friend of number nine. Your help will always be appreciated. Thank you very much. Oh, interesting. Okay, here we go. That's what I need to do right there. And then I need to go back to this. So that's our, uh, that was our celebration last month for uh, blowing the whistle that we had created. It was uh, a very wonderful moment for us to be able to give number nine uh, her voice back. So, um, uh, Chris Rizzoli says that, uh, meanwhile, back at my script, <laughs> uh, Chris Rizzoli says that the thing people remember most about steam engines are their sounds. The, the pulsing of the noises that they make makes them sound almost alive as long as there's a fire inside. But he says that no sound is more memorable than the whistle. We think that's true. So also, there is a, uh, there's one other artifact that survives from the Mount Tamalpais Railroad. Um, it's a beautifully restored metal model of uh, Mount Tamalpais steam engine that is currently on display at the Marin Museum of Bicycling in Fairfax. They'll be open, uh, they're open Thursday through uh, Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. The exhibit is made possible in part through Friends of Number Nine and Ascon Metals in Chicago, who actually is the 
surviving company that scrapped uh, Mount Tamalpais's railroad. Uh, this was a uh, piece that was left over that they were able to take back to Chicago and kept it in their main offices as a trophy. Um, we've been able to borrow it back for a time to uh, let people in Marin see this model. It was built by a man named Howard Folker uh, because he wanted to learn to be the machinist for the Mountain Railroad. And this was his test to create this metal model in a time before models were really uh, seen much at all. Um, he had to go out to the engines outside the shops, measure the bits and pieces, um, and then create them at one tenth scale using the original metals, brass, uh, steel, um, he didn't make the nuts and bolts um, or screws, but uh, but he built this as a way of learning to be the machinist for the Mountain Railroad, and he did it. Uh, Phil Gazzano uh, restored the model and felt that it would take have taken him three years to build the model, uh, so from 1908 to 1911. And in 1911, it went on display um, in the ticket office of the Mountain Railroad in the uh, Palace Hotel on Market Street in San Francisco. Say, say, Fred, uh, this is Joe. Uh, yeah. Is your screen share on? I don't, I think I lost I your, so. I think I lost yeah. your screen share. So you might want to go back to All that. Right. Backing up. To the, back um, to the slide presentation that you, you had when you. Okay. You, yeah. Sorry about that. That's right. You're, you have to flip from the video to the, to the there presentation again. There we go, and then I got this part here, and there we are. So that's where we need to be, right? Perfect. Oh, good. All right. So, um, this should be it here. All right, so um, as I mentioned before, Chris Rizzoli said that the uh, this, the sounds of a steam engine are the thing that people remember about steam engines. They're not like, diesel engines at all. Um, but he says that no sound is more memorable than the sound of the whistle. So here's the other uh, thing I was talking about, a one-tenth scale model. It's about four feet long. The full-sized steam engine would have been about 40 feet long. Um, Phil Gazzano of uh, Fairfax uh, restored the model. We uh, got it on loan from Ascon Metals, the outfit that had, uh, the descendant of the, uh, of the outfit that scrapped the Mountain Railroad. Um, they had it in a back room and we borrowed, we borrowed it from them, cleaned it up and Phil uh, recreated parts that had been missing. For example, the whistle at the, um, um, up here on the, on the engine had been lost over the years. Um, and so Phil machined a brand new one using original photos that uh, he, we had borrowed from uh, the Ann Kent room. Lori Thompson and uh, Carol Acquaviva had helped us with that. So Phil recreated those parts and uh, the model is really lovely and it's on display right now at the Museum of, uh, Bi the Marine Museum of Bicycling in Fairfax um, until the fall. The museum is open from Thursday through Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and of course face masks are required. So um, I wanna thank uh, all kinds of people that helped make made this talk possible. Um, thank you also for joining us today for this talk about number nine on the Mountain Railroad. That's our website if you care to go and watch more of the uh, of our live centennial event for number nine. And this, of course, is number nine, the last survivor of the railroad. And it's the last piece of a great story. And that's my show for today. There we go. So, anybody uh, have questions? Yeah, let's, uh, Fred, you can turn off your your uh, screen share. All right. And Stopping sharing. Then stop sharing, yes. <laughs> ah, the wonders of Zoom. So Yes. <laughs> it's, it's always an experience. Uh, but that's fantastic. That was a wonderful presentation, Fred. Thank I, you. The, the pictures are beautiful. They are uh, very high, high quality, high definition. It, well, that, just that was, thank you. That That's um, a big part of that was, uh, you know, when Ted Wern gave me his collection, he already had wonderful photos. Um, and then we've expanded the collection 
since then. And uh, eBay has been a terrific resource where we've found photos that we never expected. And in fact, being part of the Gravity Car Barn, the State Park's Gravity Car Barn, um, occasionally people send things looking for some vestige of the railroad and finding the Gravity Car Barn. And, and so sending something to the friends of Mount, uh, Mount Tam who um, you know, basically take care of the, the Gravity Car Barn and they find their way to me Sometimes people saying, is this worth anything? Does this have any value? And I'm frequently stunned by the things that people send. Uh, pictures that, you know, uh, they were about to throw out. <laughs> and uh, and we're, we're lucky that, that uh, they have, something happens and they decide that they're gonna send it to us. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're certainly beautiful pictures. It's Thank you. wonderful that you've preserved them and they, they, they don't look a hundred years old. That's That's for sure. Uh, that's part of the fun of it is is actually uh, going in and, and using all the modern computer um, techniques to be able to clean the photographs up and clear away the dirt and this, the noise and all that and see what was what was there when they shot the original photograph. Yeah. I'll have to do that with some of my family, old family photos. <laughs> <laughs> one one of these go. days. One yeah, of these right. days. Well, let's see. We, we do have several questions. Uh, Great. Let me see. Robin is asking us, asking you, um, are there gravity car pieces still in the creek in Mill Valley? Um, don't know, probably not. Most of the, um, most of, most of the pieces that are, were in there um, have been scooped out. Um, every once in a while, somebody finds a bolt or a, um, another, another relic. One of the things that we have uh, that somebody found in there was actually a drawbar that um, we that was we were told about and and have in a corner because we don't have a good way to display it yet. Um, the drawbars, uh, the drawbar that we have was used to connect the locomotive and the gravity cars. Gravity cars had drawbar uh, had a drawbar to connect the gravity cars together so they could make a gravity train as many as four cars long. Those drawbars were four feet long. Uh, Bill, Pro these are some of the things that Bill Provines told us uh, over breakfast uh, over many years, which is a great way to learn about the railroad. Uh, but the drawbar that connected the gravity cars and the engines had to be longer because if it wasn't, then as they went through the turns, the, the wheels that were closest to the engine would get lifted off the track, and that was frequently a bad idea. So uh, the, the longer drawbar needed to be used between the locomotive and the gravity cars, and usually they were, the drawbar was stored on the engine. So uh, that drawbar hopefully will go with number nine, um, you know, so that it can illustrate that point. Uh, so that's pretty exciting that we actually would have an original engine and original drawbar to help illustrate those facets. Fantastic. See, uh, our, our friend and, and supporter, Tom Perry, I wanted to know what's the status of the move to the top of Mount Tam? So um, we are, we don't know the destination of number nine yet. Um, we have been, um, we hope we are, we're, part of our goals are to try to find a way to put the engine back on the old right of way so that it has historic value in its location, mm -hmm. that it un underscores the, you know, the route that it used to work. And the two most accessible uh, places for that would be either Mill Valley at the depot or East Peak. Um, but both of those are in a process that will require a tremendous amount of negotiation. Um, and so we're trying to find um, who will be most interested uh, in, in helping us find a location for number nine. And we're, the town of Mill Valley is cautiously interested the state parks have also said that they're interested. They're they're uh, working on a plan for uh, redevelopment of the East Peak to try to improve the visitor facilities, um, and that they have had a placeholder for Number Nine as part of that plan. Um, that the East Peak process is uh, currently um, on hold. Um, the person that had been planning that had been moved away to Sacramento and was working on COVID-related things in Sacramento. So that's where. Everything's on hold at the, this point, mostly because of COVID. So that's that's what we know about that. Okay. The um, yeah, I'm, COVID has affected everybody in unusual ways, and um, 
you're no exception there with, and number nine is no exception. Let's see, uh, Hal uh, asks, uh, I, don't, I don't see the firebox under the cab in the original as delivered from the factory. Yes, uh, very good point. I'll just kind of scoot over to the side here so you can see. Sharp This is where the firebox should be under here where my finger is. Um, so the firebox is, is where the fire raged underneath the boiler. Um, on some engines, it would have been coal. Using coal, others would have been used wood. Number nine and, and uh, most of the engines on Mount Tamalpais used oil. And that was a terrific thing for, uh, for Mount Tamalpais on several levels because coal and wood um, were more likely to produce embers that could start fires. Um, oil didn't tend to do that. Um, so, and, and part of the, the, every trip that was made up Mount Tamalpais involved uh, the firemen uh, scooping sand into the firebox and the sand would be sucked through the, the boiler tubes um, and scour out the inside of the boiler tubes to remove things that would become embers. And they'd fly up the smokestack and then uh, rain down on the right of way behind the train. Um, the uh, the point of that was to you know uh, because oil didn't have the likelihood for embers the way that um, wood and coal did that that was a, a good boon for the railroad but it also saved the railroad for a tremendous amount of money I found a short story that mentioned that um, in the days when they used wood to make a round trip up the mountain it cost the railroad seven dollars and change to fuel the engine going up the mountain and coming back down. When they converted to oil, it cost a dollar and change, so a substantial savings in the cost of fuel. Um, on the shop order, more specifically to the question, um, where they ordered uh, the construction of number nine, specifically it says in the notes that um, Mill Valley would actually uh, outfit the bricks, um, would would build the bricks of the firebox below the uh, the fire pan below the the engine. So that's part of the reason why you don't see it here. Um, but there's also a story that we have in oral, from oral history that says that the firebox didn't breathe as well as, uh, as they had hoped, so it had to be enlarged. Um, that story is a little bit suspect, but um, anyway, that's why you don't see it, because the original order said, you know, don't, don't build the firebox um, and then travel 2,000 miles across America to Mill Valley. It'll be better if we build it here. So that's... That's why you don't see it in this photograph. Wow. We've, How's that for a long answer? Yeah. Well, it's, it's amazing that you, you have answers. You, you, know, you know so much about the uh, locomotive, even what's, uh, mm -hmm. what's going on with the, uh, with the firebox. <laughs> it's been, well, that's, that's part of what we've had to do. Um, you know, the, when you, um, um, when you want to restore something, the first thing you need to do is pick a target for restoration. If you just kind of haphazardly do the restoration, then you don't get something that's rewarding. And this um, engine number nine is without a doubt the most unique engine on the railroad, partly because it had the, this wonderful lettering on it. No other steam engine on Mount Tam had this uh, lettering with gold leaf, real gold leaf. It says on the shop order, it says imitation gold leaf, and then somebody drew a line through the, the word imitation. So these are real gold leaf letters that are on the engine with this deep red drop shadow, likely against a black background. There's still some debate about that. Um, but um, that would have, the letters, the lettering and that graphic look would have had a real snap to it. Uh, that would have been a real eye catcher. So um, part of what we wanted to show was um, the things that Mill Valley put on the engine uh, that weren't on, you know, that weren't put on uh, the locomotive in Erie, Pennsylvania. And so this shows the engine as in its new state with the modifications that Mill Valley put on it. And so our, our restoration goal is actually six months after it arrived in Mill Valley, it looked like this with a, a handful of modifications, um, some of which are still actually on the, on the engine today, which is just mind blowing. A thing called a thing, uh, a system for watering the wheels. Because if you've ever ridden on a train, every time a train goes through a turn, there's a screech that happens with each turn as the wheels chafe against the, the inside of the steel rail. And uh, the, com the passengers complained about that. And of course, the crookedest road in the world would have had a lot of screeching. So um, they uh, developed a system of wheel watering 
uh, that quenched the noise to some degree, reduced the, you know, the squeal and all that. The nozzles of that wheel watering system and some of the plumbing still are intact. And some of it even looks, you know, brand new, it's, which is, oh. you know, uh, remarkable after a hundred years. So. So Pacific Lumber, when they were using this as a workhorse for their lumber operations, they were still using that, that water system? No, that, that would have only have ever worked on Mill Valley. It just wasn't in the way of Pacific Lumber. So rather than going to the trouble of removing it, they just said, you know, just leave it there. And oh. so most of it survived. And uh, I just, it's amazing to see. Yeah. It's an example of the Tamil Pius workmanship um, and uh, and the one of the unique features of Mount Tamil Pius. And the, in fact, the only existing example of that from Mount Tamil Pius. We, we have, um, Antonia wanted to share a little bit of, of history, not so much a question, but uh, her father, Carlo Lestrato, and his brother, Emilio Don Lestrato, in their childhood in Ross, <clears throat> she says they used to hike up Mount Tam and sneak ice cream from the train car that brought food up to the restaurant. And that uh, Don was born in 1907, and and uh, Carlo in 1912, and the train and ice cream stories are uh, are treasured by by all of them. I guess they used to bring ice cream up there. Hmm. Yeah, they well that that was how all the supplies got to the tavern, um, and West Point Inn and Muir Woods as well. I mean, it would you how could you beat the the uh, convenience of having a railroad stopping at your front door, you know, several times a day for mail, for newspapers, for laundry, for anything that you needed, the railroad would deliver it or pick it up. And that, you know, there was a post office at the tavern at East Peak. There was also a post office in, in Muir Woods and you could get your, um, your mail stamped. Um, okay. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. There isn't, there wasn't an, an official post office in Muir Woods, only at East Peak. But there are plenty of postcards that have a Tamil Pius postmark on them. Um, and um, Bill talked about how the uh, on the car closest to the engine was where all the things that were headed for the tavern were put. Because when the engine arrived, when the train arrived, that was the closest to the doorway to get things into the tavern. So, um, you know, fresh milk, fresh eggs, all the food, you know, supplies that the restaurant needed and all that came by train, Bill Provines also talked about how they would bring um, uh, ginger ale to the, uh, made by Clico Club. But he said, you know, the funny part was when the bottles broke, it didn't smell like ginger ale at all, it smelled like wine. So that was kind of interesting. That was that was one of a prohibition era perk, I guess, is that gin ginger ale didn't smell like ginger ale, it smelled like wine. Oh, um, okay. And then another story um, was that uh, Ralph Cleway, who was a young boy living at West Point, um, I'm, you know, really proud that I met these guys and got some stories before they passed away. But Ralph uh, and his family uh, were at the West Point Inn. His parents ran the West Point Inn from the summer of 1919 into 1924. So they were there on the mountain when number nine was working on the mountain. Um, uh -huh. And um, Ralph was friends with the train crews. Um, and when he was four years old, when they moved into the, into the West Point Inn and nine years old when they moved away, and they'd say to Ralph, you know, come on, Ralph, get on the train. And, and he'd jump on board the train and, and the train would then head away to the East Peak. And he'd play around up at East Peak for a while with the train crews watching him as an extended family. And then bring him when the next scheduled run was back down the mountain, they'd bring him back to West Point and his folks got a break. They didn't have to watch Ralph for uh, an hour or so. Um, and Ralph got to be, you know, best friends with the train crew. I can't imagine a more fun thing for, you know, a little kid to be friends with the train crew and have your own steam railroad at the front door, you know, every day to go for a ride. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, great stories about that. And the mountain play was another thing that was going on while Ralph was there. That's how I learned that story about, um, and, and I didn't talk about this in the story, but um, uh, about how uh, when the mountain play happened in those days, there was only one performance the railroad uh, would bring the, the director and the actors to the West Point Inn on Saturday. Uh, they'd climb off the train, leave their personal things at the inn, head over to the theater and have a rehearsal over there and come back for a rowdy dinner at the inn that night. And, uh, and of course, everybody spent the night. And the next morning, the 
actors and the director would get up, they'd have a, you know, a, a breakfast and head off over to the mountain theater to get ready for the play. And as they were heading over to the mountain theater, playgoers would begin to arrive at the West Point Inn. Martin Cleway, Ralph's dad, would take orders for a fresh chicken dinner. Um, and the chicken dinners were so fresh, the chickens were running around the inn in those days because there was no refrigeration. That's how the inn got its fresh eggs and fresh chickens. Um, and so uh, a handful of playgoers would come back to the West Point Inn and enjoy chicken on the porch, the chicken dinner on the porch. And then uh, in 1920, they built a place called the uh, Dining Room, which today is known as the Members Lounge. And they were able to accommodate a lot more people at that point, uh, more fresh chicken dinners. And uh, they had to hire extra staff because it was so busy and all that. So, and then uh, Leonora Russell is another story that um, Bob Hemstock uh, introduced us to. Uh, Leonora lived to be over 100. She lived in Ross Valley. She, as a little girl, she was riding a gravity car down the mountain that was that derailed. And, uh, and she said, yeah, it was no big deal. And we said, how could that be remotely possible that a derailed gravity car on Mount Tamil Pius would not be a big deal? And she said, yeah, no big deal. You know, we're going down the mountain. Uh, the gravity car went off the rails, but it never touched the ground. It didn't bounce along on the ties or anything like that. Um, the way the gravity cars were constructed, uh, there's a big beam across the front end and across the back end um, and, and pegs uh, that straddled the track. So, so if you went off the rails, you'd land on that beam and the pegs would locate you. Uh, so you wouldn't go very far right or left. You'd uh, land on the beam. The pegs would hold you in place, and then uh, the beam would also act as a brake, and you'd become you'd come pretty steadily, but not abruptly, to a stop. And uh, and she said that there was a woman in the row behind her who freaked out, and uh, the operator, the gravity man, said, "Don't jump, don't jump." And she jumped into the hillside and broke her leg, and everybody else on board the gravity car was okay. So, um, uh, and you know, and because they, the gravity car didn't show up on time, the railroad knew that that something had gone wrong. So they sent out a train to pick them up and bring them back in. But um, that was a really wonderful story. And Leonora Russell of Ross Valley was a hero for us by being the only person that we'd ever met had been in a gravity car derailment. Well, thank you, thank you for that story, and, and thank you, Fred. Uh, we're, we're about at the end of our hour. I think we're, we ran a little bit over. I apologize, but, uh, but this has been a, this has been wonderful to hear all these all these stories. Uh, Fred, I got a quick question. How did you power the whistle when you blew it for the centennial? Um, we had hoped to use steam, but that uh, wound up not working out. I have a couple of friends who work in movies that have steam equipment that could have worked out, but the steam equipment was unavailable. So um, we used compressed air, uh, thanks to uh, our friends at Herc Rentals that uh, gave us a compressor that would normally power a jackhammer. You need a lot of air to blow a steam whistle. So we, that's what we used to, to run the whistle on number nine for its centennial on April 18th. All right, well, appreciate your efforts and everybody on that number nine board and all the people working on it. Great project and looking forward to it uh, continuing. We're having a lot of fun with it. We appreciate all the support that we get. Um, thanks for letting us be part of your of the Ross Historical Society today. Thank you. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to have you, and thank you for uh, everybody for uh, for joining us today. We appreciate the fantastic turnout. Uh, please consider joining us next month. We'll send out some information. Julia Flynn Seiler will be speaking about her new book the white devil's daughters and it's a it's a fantastic book we'll send out some more information about it that looks to be a very a very exciting program as well so um, and with that i just uh thank you again fred thank you richard and everybody else for joining us today and and uh please join us again have a wonderful day thank you joe thank you fred thanks thanks joe thanks richard the pleasure